What's up, everybody? We have 10-ish minutes here, as usual. In fact, we've actually had a few people say that they enjoy when we go over 10 minutes. So Who would have thunk it, this could be This could be one of those ones that we potentially go over a bit, because across the table from Mark and myself, we have Mr. Travis Vogel. Hi, he is on the team here at Vortex. He does a lot of different things. Um, and one of the things he does really well is occasionally when we have some experiences going on here, he cooks. I do like to make food for people. It's one of those things that's... Uh Brings everybody together. It's a cool thing. Absolutely. Now you have uh, a bit of a background in cooking, right? You actually went to yep. school. For yeah, this. I went to culinary school here locally. Uh, it was a great experience. It was one of those things that when I got out of the army, didn't know what to do with myself, and I really like to eat, which hopefully it's showing less and less these days <laughs> as I try and work out a little more. But yeah, it's a uh, it, it's a good thing. He also goes by uh, Virgil here, so if you hear that slip out, Chef Virgil is sometimes what he's referred to as around the office. So uh, today we wanted to discuss steaks. The Perfect steak. The very divisive topic of steaks as well. I was going to say, your first ever podcast with us, and and we're going (laughs) to throw you to the wolves by giving you a topic that nobody agrees on. Yeah, Yeah. I I feel like you said, everybody, this is one where everybody thinks they're right, Right. including me. I showed Travis a picture of what I thought was the perfect steak. And he goes, eh, you're pretty close. And right. I'm like, no, you incorrect. He, you 100% he were gave close. You mad respect, yo, but like not quite, yeah. It's, it wasn't the affirmation I was looking for, Jim. It's one of those things that the methodology of steak has changed forever and ever as we're continually, all of these new cooking methods are coming about and even using extremely old ones, but brought back. Um, but before we get into methodology, everyone has a favorite steak cut, right? Okay, yeah. And I'm kind of between a couple. It depends on the day. It depends on what I'm looking for. But all of them offer something different. If we're talking about beef steak, commonly tenderloin slash filet is a really big one for a lot of folks. Extremely lean, uh, extremely soft texture for that leanness, which is usually not common together. Ribeye, which is generally viewed as the king. Mm -hmm. A lot of fat, well marbled, great flavor. New York strip is actually one of my favorites. I like New York strip. Hashtag agree. A lot of flavor. Not necessarily that super soft texture that you get a tenderloin, but significantly improved flavor over uh, over a tenderloin. And then you've got porterhouse, which is a strip and a tenderloin together. Okay, oh, I boy. don't like that one. Not a fan. Of it the seems like the best of both worlds. It would, but they cook at different rates. So you take a, f- a significantly softer meat and a little bit more firm meat, and they don't end up at the same temperature, and you overcook the one, which is softer, to get the other one to where you want it. Ah, Tragic. You're always Not my playing favorite. that game, uh, yeah. tweener. It's a balance game, and I'd rather just have one that's really good. Mm-hmm. So that's just my view. Uh, someone can probably throw a really good comment back as to why I'm wrong, and that's the best part about this topic. I feel like that pertains to like a lot of things in life, though. You can do two things okay, or like one thing really good. Oh, absolutely. True. You know? True. Absolutely. Now, so. When it comes to the methodology, and I want to ask this mm-hmm. real quick too, because you're going to jump in. I know, you know, like you were just talking about beef cuts and stuff like that. Do you also apply the same thing to your wild game? Um, I do, uh, as far as the, the, we'll get to this in a second, but doneness is extremely important in those things because oh, yeah, they yeah. tend to be closer to that strip type steak or yep. a tenderloin, but they don't necessarily have the softness um, because they're a little bit more used muscles in, an, in a wild animal. Um, I do consider prep very similar. I consider cooking methodology all very similar. Doneness temperature might change a little bit depending on the animal okay. and how, how it close it is to that. Got that it. makes um, a lot of sense. Got it. Beef is kind of the, the all net, the, the combining land where we can all you know test all of our stuff because we don't want to test a new recipe on beautiful elk or you know I mean mule deer for example or antelope. Um, to me, they almost need no no seasoning. Mm. We just want to get a, ni- a pan nice and hot. They're very ten- they're very uh, tender, very lean cuts. I don't want to apply long time cook times to them because they are so lean. I want to put high temp, get them seared, get them to maybe medium rare, if not a little bit before, pull them, let them rest, put a, put a little bit of butter on them and be done. Well, and I noticed you used the word pan there too, so mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah. That's, that is one of those things. Um, it, well, it's, we've talked about it enough. Let's get to process because it is Let's kind of it. where things are. Let's do it. Let's so, let the chef. So everyone flow. knows. Mark showed me a steak that it was really well seared on both sides or all sides uh, around the outside, and then had a really nice dark red center. Mm-hmm. So it was a super hot, fast, and sear on a cold steak, which is something that I like, and that's one of the older methods. When we see something is called blue, which is kind of pre-rare, extremely high, extremely high heat. You know, good crust on the uh, both of the outsides, and then almost cold center. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's yeah. blue. Yeah, um, rare is the next step up from there. Um, let's, let's roll this road, and then we go to medium rare. Medium rare is kind of the standard for most people. Um, as we go up this chart, we're not only getting less and less 
temp, cold temperature, we're also getting more and more firm texture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So somewhere every once in a while, I'll order a medium steak when I want a little bit more texture on it or a little bit easier to chew. Whereas some of the um, rare, mid rare blue has almost a. It's just a different texture. It's a little softer, mm -hmm. but a little bit more chewy. Yeah, it mm -hmm. takes a little bit longer to get exactly. Through. And it so every once in it. a while, I'll pick a medium steak because I just want to change that up, and I do like that. I don't do it very often, um, but anybody who goes beyond that should just eat a burger and get out. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that we established the line. Yeah, the line is at yeah, like medium. Medium. If you're there and you're and you start going beyond it, it's like all right, we, let's talk. Wow. Well, and you know, there's folks who do like that. And when I was working, uh, I worked. They're at just a, wrong. I worked right? at a restaurant a ways back. I, I think so, in my opinion. <laughs> um, order a burger. I mean that because you can cook a burger. And the logic here is actually a safety logic and also a food science logic. Um, a burger or a steak in general, the muscle as a whole, right? As we cut through it, only the um, the faces that we've cut are now possible to have any contaminant, as in any sort of anything on them, right? The outside edges. We can kill all that. All the muscular tissue inside of those edges is perfectly sanitary. Mm -hmm. So once we sear those off, that steak's good to eat. Mm -hmm. However, a burger has all of those outside elements tossed all through in, mixed up as it's ground. So yeah, let's go to a midwell on a, on a burger, medium midwell. Yeah. I know some guys will order it mid-rare. By all means, your choice. I like a little bit better texture there, so I'm a medium well, just to take that a whole other I, I edge on that side yeah. as well. Yeah. Agreed. I will never go well done. I don't want to chew on a hockey puck or someone's shoe. It's right. not what I want. Unless you need to, like, throw it at somebody. Like, you're like, ah! Let's see it. Okay. Self-defense burger. Okay, okay. Uncle yeah. Rico. <laughs> <laughs> Catch this frisbee of beef across those mountains. Seriously. Um, um, all right. So, back to the steak. Now, how are you cooking your perfect steak? In my opinion, there are two... Well, there's one methodology, a couple different executions. So reverse sear has become the standard. We have the most control. We have the most opportunity to make that steak the best it can be, and it's consistent as all get out. Mm -hmm. So what reverse sear is, is we're going to cook the whole steak at a lower temperature until it gets to the right internal temp. For me, more often than not, who's a mid-rare guy, I'm going to pull that steak at about 125 degrees okay. internal temp. Are you using a meat thermometer? thermometer Preferably ther a thermometer, yes. <laughs> so you're not just like eyeballing, like, yeah, no. that's about this. You, you, there are some things you can do when it's fully done and we're on a hot grill to, mm -hmm. to understand when medium rare does happen. Um, but I always use a meat te meat thermometer at that one. Now I'm going to get get it all backwards. But uh, a meat thermometer at that point, get to about 100, 125 degrees, depending on how long I want to sear it. Okay. So if it's a real big, thick steak, I can probably sear it a little longer, get a little more crust on it. So okay. I might pull it at 120 because it's going to take a little longer to get to 127, 130 before I rest, and then 135 is medium rare. Okay. Um, so there's two ways to get to that central point. Um, as of recently, we've done a lot of work with uh, Traeger grills, and yeah. so smoking in general. Um, I've been a sous vide guy for a long time. Sous vide is, if you have the ideal situation, you vacuum seal that steak, no salt seasonings as you want, uh, and then stick it in the vacuum or the sous vide, which is uh, circulating water at 120 or whatever your temperature is degrees for about an hour. That whole steak will then be top to bottom. And this is what I was actually talking about with your steak, Mark, mm -hmm. um, that was very close. So that whole steak from perfect center all the way out to the edges is now 125 degrees. Yeah. And then, then we'll pull it, we'll pat it dry, pack it full of salt, and here's where we hit the pan. I prefer a pan or a grill, either one. Some people, and a charcoal, wood fired is always good. Wood mm -hmm. fires flavor. Um, but a cast iron's the most usable skillet has been forever. Mm -hmm. If you find old skillets that are in good shape, man, keep running those. They're so good. Oh, yeah. They're so good. But uh, hit a little bit of fat in your very hot skillet. Sear those edges, both, both sides. Um, and then here's that point where that little trick is. As soon as you see the first little bit of blood pop out of the top of that steak, mm -hmm. it's at medium rare pull it. Oh. Or it will be when it rests. So Okay. All right. Yep. That's one of my favorites is if I don't have a thermometer on me, or I'm running a lot of stuff on the grill and I need to be watching, I can do that real quick. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, three to four minutes or three minutes a side or so, depending on, again, how long until you see that, mm -hmm. you might get one side a little bit more done. Um, the professionals are, of course, very, very good at this. And they can actually tell that temperature by how it is on their hand. We could go over that, but thermometers are really common now, and they're such a good tool. Yeah, and they're not that expensive. I was mm -hmm. talking to somebody about that. They're like, oh, yeah, it's like, you know, 20, 30 bucks. You get yeah. good. Now, what I've always done on the grill, and I always just use a regular gas grill, Jim, gasp, I know. 
Uh, <sighs> but I poke. I didn't. I don't know like what temperature it is. Yeah. But I just you know poke it, and I'm like, oh, when it's like a good kind of like firm ish sponge not firm sponge at all but like yeah. spongy i'm like yeah i can take that off yep. it's good to go yep and so what's cool is that's a really good way to do that the unfortunate thing is steak goes through two phases of firm ish and then it softens for a minute and then it comes back oh my so especially gosh. if you go cold mm. it's a sinusoidal curve gem how'd you like that Whoa. math yeah. reference Jeez. Talking it's, to it's the been a while since i've run one of those um but yeah, as, as that steak, that if it were cold when we put it on there, mm-hmm. it'll actually start to warm up and becomes firm, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden it'll taper away, and then it will start to re-firm again, and that's where we want to be. That's why I like a thermometer, because it's not going to lie to me, whereas my hand and my, my intuition's been like, oh, I pulled a steak, and it's like still blue rare, because mm-hmm. I've been doing 90 other things. Right, yeah, I've We've done We've all that. been there where you get, where you get sidetracked. Dude, so. you know what's the worst, too, is when you've got, like, you know, a significant other who prefers more, like, the medium, bordering on a medium well, even though you try to convince otherwise, and then you, like, you pull something off way too early, it is blue in the center, essentially, and then, like, it needs to go back to the grill, and yeah. you're like, ah, oh. so here, here's everything the, is now, like, I don't know how to... The process here, has been interrupted. Here's actually the cheater way, you know, because like we used to have to do this. So I worked in a restaurant once upon a time, and every once in a while, somebody would get something and want it well done, and they'd order, like, a 10-ounce filet that's, like, this thick, and... Well, our guys in the back would be like, "Hey, can we can we butterfly this steak for them so it's you know half the thickness?" Oh yeah, because so now you, now you're, you're exposing a- that significantly underdone section. Yeah, put that back on the grill real quick, and you get really quick temperature change. So that way you're not uh, you're not waiting forever on a two and a half inch thick steak to get well done. Which yeah, is- or and then just meanwhile turning the outside to just charcoal, carbon. charcoal. Absolutely. <laughs> Seriously, you literally could use it as a hockey puck to start the next fire. Yeah, yeah. Um, how about uh, okay? So the reverse sear method, like you said, yep. so you're doing some some means of getting it up to a certain temperature, yep. and then you're just giving it that quick crust on the outside, absolutely. right? By searing it at a really high heat, and that's pretty important, yep. right? The, that high heat application, absolutely. And so that's one thing where once we pull that steak out of whatever we're doing to get it there, and the nice thing is, is whatever we're getting to do it there, we have a lot of time, generally about an hour or so, where we can prep everything else. Mm-hmm. So when it comes time to focus on steak, we're focused on steak. And that's oh, a huge yeah, thing. Yeah, that's Cause nice. Because how many times have we been taken away from the grill and something goes over? It happens all the time. Right. That's why I like this so much. Um, an oven's also another way to get it there if you don't have either of those two other options. Yeah. And that's that's actually not a bad way either. Usually it only goes, I mean, mine only goes down to 170, so you still have to watch it. Yeah, I'd run yeah. around 200. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. 200, 250. And you can still bring it up nice and slow that way. It's not right. going to go way over. Right. Um, but... Another divisive section is what do we put on steak? Anyone who's a Letterkenny yes. fan has seen an entire episode devoted to uh, salt and pepper and uh, <laughs> the, the great Gordon Ramsay. Um, but uh, um, I'm kind of a combination of a few things. I love salt and pepper. If I'm going to sous vide it or any of the reverse sears, I'm not putting my salt on until the very end okay. because it will get a little too salty for me. But I oh, do, yeah. mm-hmm. do want to p- come back and then get, grab liberally uh, salt that steak right before I put it on the heat so that I can get that surface to actually pull that moisture out of it from that steak, and then I get a really good sear. Because just like caramelizing anything, if there's moisture in the way, it's just going to steam. We don't want that. So we want that really nice and dry outer section of the steak mm-hmm. okay. to get that really good crust. I was going to okay. say, that that salt even seems like it kind of becomes part of the yeah. crust to me yep. as well. Yeah, I don't know absolutely. if that's actually what's happening. Well, but it is, is because it's actually pulling all the moisture past it, and it's somewhat soaking in. Like a, everyone's brined a turkey before, I assume. Um, to make wild assumptions. If not, we can definitely do that on another episode. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what we're doing is we're actually short trading <laughs> moisture and we're, then we're importing some salt into that first layer. Okay, yeah. Um, and what that's allowing us to do is increase that flavor profile, but also then reduce that moisture so that that then sears more quickly. So we're not trying to steam that steak anymore. We're trying to actually uh, sear and caramelize that very quickly. Yeah. I, I got, hey, let, what kind of salt do you like? I'm a car, I'm a coarse kosher salt guy. Me too. I like it. I like the crystals. I like the way they break down. And if I sit them on the steak long enough, we'll actually get a little bit of a puddle on that steak. And I'll pour that uh, pour that water off, hit that on the grill. Ends up being really great. I do like that kind of salt. I like as texture well. though. I think it makes a difference. You talk about the the caramelization that you get going on there too. Yeah. So I know like uh, you're kind of it's because you're dealing with the glucose and the meat. Is that right? Like yeah. it's basically sugary stuff. Everything right? has sugar in it. Yeah. Um, how many times have uh, we tried? Especially where, where where this fails more often than not is in vegetables. Right? Have you had really good pan caramelized carrots? Mm-hmm. Yes. They're awesome, right? Totally. You don't need to add any sugar to that. 
what we need to do is put those in enough mo- in enough salt to suck a lot of that moisture out of them, at which point we'll see a puddle in the bottom. We actually go back and rinse those carrots. I do this with zucchini. I do this with all the really wet, um, really wet vegetables so yeah. that I can actually get a caramelization on them. So the reason we're rinsing them is because once we pull out all that moisture, a lot of that salt's gone into that into that place, right? So there's a salt residue all around that par- all around that piece of food, mm-hmm. and I don't want that on there because now there's more than I, exactly there's more than I can control. So a quick rinse, moisture's not going to go back in. It's not possible. But however, what I can do is rinse that entire salt car- or, um, salt bag around that effectively, and then put what I want on it. Okay. But we've removed so much we removed so much moisture that now we can increase caramelization significantly more quickly. I never. I guess I never equated the fact that we need to remove moisture in order for that caramelization to happen. Because it's a, yeah. like one of the things about a quote perfect steak, is when you get a steak with a really good crust on. You like mm-hmm. clack mm-hmm. on the crust and it feels oh. yeah oh oh yeah. yeah. I Absolutely. mean it's very similar to in that regard uh, French bread or something yeah. like that oh, where sure. you get, get you know yep. it's like a really good crispy outside, but then as soon as you get inside it's that like almost doughy you know it's, it's a super classic French fry. How many of us have had really, really good French fries where the inside is almost like perfect mashed potato and the right. outside is just this nice crunch, brittle crunch? Oh, it's so good. A little bit mm. of salt. Yeah, I'm a happy yeah. fan. Yeah, and in, in that case, then too, you don't need to be doing any sort of like a, uh, if you're doing it well, you don't need yep. to necessarily do a steak rub or something with a bunch of like sugar in it. Mm-mm. Nope. Right. What we're, that's what that process is allowing us to do is oh, circumvent adding things to it because I'm a very much a fan of treat this element whatever it happens to be treat it with the utmost care and, and thoughtfulness and that allows that element to shine so we don't have to add a ton of stuff to it mm-hmm. um, on that note going back to seasoning real quick salt is huge because it pulls moisture removes bitterness so it's going to improve that to te- improve that uh, texture and taste for us i put a little black pepper on there because mm. again we're talking about balance in a previous uh, conversation before this but we we're just talking about food and balance in general cracked or just out of the shaker i like cracked me too. So, uh, real coarse, um, cracked. Uh, sometimes I'll use the side of the knife and just smash it down on, on uh, corns, peppercorns, and, and get them to be as... I don't want them huge. I don't want to bite into a whole peppercorn. Right. But about, if it could be a quarter of one, that'd be pretty ideal for me. Hmm. I like that because pepper is a balancing point to the fat in the steak. That, okay. I really like that. Because it's kind of sharp? Yeah. Um, acid balances fat. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Does, so does hot and spicy. Sure. So, you see a lot of... Uh, like a lot of the, the Korean stuff where it's steak and then they have some very spicy options. Yeah. That's where we see that whole balance come together is, yes, it's great and fatty and gloriously textured, but we've got this little bit of heat that yeah, actually balances that pop, it. Yep, you know? and it actually brings, removes, it physically removes some of the fat from your taste buds. Mm-hmm. So it actually, your taste buds can retaste that steak. Otherwise, you end up with what you get with like, you know, when you eat... Uh, really dark heavy meat with like gravy all over it and you're just like you're just falling asleep as it's entering your mouth <laughs> yeah i don't think you can ever get the meat sweats on steak either by the way but that's a different one somebody could probably prove to be but yeah things like that like roast with gravy and big burgers and stuff like that yeah that'll happen mm-hmm. um the last thing that i do like to put on uh, steaks is garlic powder i do like it so oh look at you okay. i've been jim i'm not, I'm not gonna lie i've been doing it right i mean other than whatever i was doing you know like that was just Close, but well, you, it was close because you just had hitting ninety five percent of the way is is where is really hard to do. There are so many things that the past has said. I mean, just like shooting, reloading, all those things, right? We have to shoot thirty cals unless they're thirty out six. Jimmy, I won't offend that one, but uh, I'm not really a thirty cal guy. I'm a seven millimeter guy on that side of things, right? We can do things okay, differently. Well. There's a lot of opportunity for us to um, ride what's technologically where it's going, and there's also a lot of history and a lot of um, Anyway, I can't think of the word, but uh, tradition. Thank you. That's yeah. exactly what I was going for. But there's history and tradition of those other things. Those are always hard to reevaluate away from mm-hmm. until you try something that's different. Yeah. And once you try something that's different, you're like, how do I get there? Mm-hmm. And that's what's so cool about this. Is again, is any of these is a steak bad? No, unless it's done past medium. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, I like. Uh, I like that. That's a good way to, to cap this one. What about? Uh, nope. I, I do have a finisher, if you will. Well, I, all right. What Travis finish? That it. was a pre cap. That was a cap to the to the actual cap. I was going to ask him about steak sauce. Uh, right. I'm actually going there, Mark. Well done, brother. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna just gonna you jump past you twenty because we're talking about steaks. And yeah. you're Probably all at this point, if we've been yeah. talking about steaks this long, you're drinking beer anyway, so you're gonna. 
Just I appreciate it when I hang out. out. It's, it's uh, I don't want to end it incomplete. That's and fair. that's actually that's where fair. we're finishing, so it's a perfect place. Steak sauce, Mark. What do you mean by steak sauce? I'm saying when a person orders like a fifty dollar steak and they say, "Hey, can you toss me that bottle?" Well, now I'm going to call it a brand. Well, we know we, we know we, we know, know the know one you're talking, you're talking about. about. We all on a all. burger. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it on a burger. I'll give you that one. I just it's I as love close. That commercial. It's as close to um, blasphemy. I wasn't gonna go there. I was gonna say it's it's as close to the th- right thought process, in my opinion, while being entirely wrong. Um, there's a lot of things in there that are good. So kind of twisted that one for me. Mm. It's all about execution, right? Steak is all about execution. So first and foremost, the best topper and probably the one that's the funniest of them all for steak. Is butter. Oh, I love butter on steaks. And now, the cool thing about butter is you can make butter extremely versatile. Mm -hmm. What kind of stuff do you like? Well, I like blue cheese. Okay, so make blue cheese and butter and combine it and throw it on your steak when you're done. Yeah. Fantastic. Let it melt on there. It'll be great. Soften up a little butter and basically just mix in whatever you like. Chives, garlic. Uh, Chives, garlic, roasted garlic especially. That's a really good one. Caramelized onions, more black pepper. I mean, you name it. If you can think of it and you like it on a steak, that's your vehicle. That is the bus that will pick everyone up. Mm. And so that that to me is the all time classic. It's always there. It's always an option. Sauce. I will say sauce because it is a thing. Um, when we make sauce in a true French version, we're talking about stuff like demi glaze. So a beef stock that's been cooked down with all sorts of really good aromatics, oh, yeah. onions, uh, all sorts of great flavor at that point. Um, one of my favorite steaks of all time came in a. Uh, port wine and Dijon mustard reduction oh, dear. in a demi glaze. That was wonderful because we had that we had the texture from that demi glaze that's just so soft, velvety, um, rich, and it just it feels elevates the steak well above where you would normally take it, which is a great place anyway. Um, but the Dijon cuts that fat too. Acid again is the other component, and there's a ton of vinegar in mustard. That's why it's so good on so many things, sausages and and, and all those cuttings. Um, there are a couple of other things that you can do to steaks. Things like Oscar style, which is with asparagus, hollandaise, and crab meat. It's a pretty oh, good way to go. Yeah. Um, you can't really okay. can't really argue with that one. It's got a lot to offer. That's a new one for me. I heard of that. I'm a That's little awesome. more... Uh, Nick's actually a big fan of that one. Loft okay. Work, so. um, but I'm a little bit more of a reservist. I'll, I'll take butter or, or a reduction if it's me. I'll tell you what, though. That, that one, uh, we'll call it B2 sauce... It uh, it did always <laughs> used to get me through as a as a child eating mom's overdone steaks. You know, right. it was, uh, at that point, it was a crash. Match. It's at that point, is it steak or is it or is steak. it something like a meatloaf? Or, <laughs> and honestly, a meatloaf with B two is great, and yeah. I will mix it in there. Yeah, it's great. I do like a meatloaf with a little barbecue sauce. Oh, yeah. on top. Yeah. Maybe we should cook a meatloaf up one of these days. Oh, we, we got should. got some crazy meatloaf we can make. Dude, I've got, love to uh, try. We got all that ground I've never had gym. meatloaf in my life that I was like, oh, yeah, meatloaf. You know, because it's just one I'm of those I'm not going to order at a restaurant, but I do I'd really love, enjoy it, and I do love a meatloaf sandwich the next day. Ooh, there's there's some have. definitely cool stuff we can make. If we can find uh, if we can find a few folks who happen to have some wild game uh, ground up in the uh, area around here, we can probably figure out a way to make a pretty B.A. meatloaf. We got, uh, we got all that. to find around these parts. Yeah, we I'm can. actually curing bacon. I uh, started it yesterday, so we could slice that up and maybe make a bacon weave and wrap that thing up. I like maybe. Yeah. Okay, next up, curing <laughs> bacon. Uh, I do have one. I've got one. Or, we're, we're all, it's over, it. Jim. Just do it. So I'm generally uh, keep things pretty darn simple, and I've and I've always done high heat. You know, like I'm like a pretty thick steak on the grill, reg, you know, regular gas grill, Jim. I know you hate. Uh, so I need to try Charcoal this. Mark. I need to try the reverse sear thing. Uh, and I've been doing a, experimenting with the uh, the cast iron a little bit lately, Good. so so that's really cool. But I mean, I'm with you. Kosher salt, cracked black pepper, and garlic powder, which I think it's maybe important to say not garlic salt, garlic yes. powder. Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna use garlic salt, that is literally salt with garlic powder in it. Right. So yeah. I guess you could but skip the uh, yep. the kosher. Maybe, you, maybe you that's could, a time. But again, it comes down it comes down to control. Salt. Yeah, and it comes down to control. How much garlic and how much salt do you want on it? I don't want someone pre-describing what I have to put on there. Yeah, McCormick. There you go. I don't want me to tell what to do. Stay out of my steak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, so I agree with you 100%. Now, I'm going to say this uh, picture that I showed you. That it was, uh, I put something on top of it kind of by accident. I know a lot of people do this, so it's not like an uncommon thing. But uh, my wife was cooking like a, like a chef salad at the same time. I was 
cooking that. Uh, I, don't know if that I think that was yeah, that was deer. That was a Wisconsin whitetail backstrap, Jim. Okay. But uh, so she had like a bunch of uh, like chopped up leftover bacon that was still in a oh, hot pan. I this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I took all that bacon plus a couple spoonfuls of the uh, the fat that was in the pan and drizzled that over the top. And I'm not a big add bacon guy because I feel like pre or post cooking. Sorry, I'm, I this missed was post cooking. Okay, I, I finished right. it and I said, "Well, that's curious." And I just that's scooped exactly. a bunch of that on there. Right, right, right. I really do feel like it kind of like enhanced and popped some things in the steak. And it, well, whatever it was, it was delicious. Bacon fat. When we're curing bacon, to go just to start this real quick, uh, bacon has a ton of fat in it. We all know right. that. We all love it. It's one of the reasons we enjoy it. But also, there's a ton of salt in there. So what you probably did, in addition to adding the glory and golden goldenness that is bacon, you added a little bit of salt that you weren't thinking about. And okay. as you cut into it, it actually got into those crevices because it's a liquid at that point. It did, yes. Yep, and, and fat is a, is a luxury feeling on our tongue. Right. And so, yeah, you're 100% in the right point. You, you finished it with, you can make bacon butter. Bacon scallion butter would probably be awesome. I'd probably put it on a potato as well as long as we're sitting next oh, to it. I might not put it on anything. Just eat it. <laughs> It's not even making it to the steak. I might wrap that in bacon. Yes. Now, that's one thing. Filet mignon, not a fan. Because the bacon's never crispy. Just to throw that out there to probably make some more people upset. Mm. Nah, I agree. If you could if you could agree. find a way to, you know, half bake it in like an oven so it gets most of the way done and then you're gonna cook your steak. But again, it's all about that execution, right? Right. Yes. Everything on point just, where you want it. Right. I would rather have a strip of bacon in my potato or next to it that's like a big old slab of bacon that's crispy and awesome and yeah. cut into that and kind of mix them together, I'd rather go that route. Good again, I have control. Makes a lot of sense. Control mm-hmm. freak. <laughs> there hey. you have it. <laughs> Good Not stuff. most things, but th- that stuff I'll absolutely take credit <laughs> for. <laughs> Good stuff. Any other ones, Mark? No, that's all I got, Jim. I'm tapped out. Best beer to go with the steak. Why not? Everybody's Ooh. already like three beers deep by this point. <laughs> exactly. in Walsh, best beer to go with the steak. I'm going to throw mine out there. Ooh, can you lead off? Because I'm struggling. I haven't had a beer in a while. Guinness. Ooh, I like mm. it. I was going to go dark. I was going to say something like a scotch ale or something like that, a little bit heavier, but a little bit of sweet, mm, kind of counter yeah. that point. But honestly, someone could say an IPA, and they probably wouldn't be wrong. It's got that astringent factor to it. It's a little bit brighter. Yeah. It would, it would really be that counterpoint for sure. That wouldn't be bad either. Yeah. Am I too picky up to say a nice glass of Merlot, Jim? I know, not not, I know that's not. I it's not a beer, but uh, it, it uh, just sounds better to me. I mean, there there are some reasons that the French are considered the culinarians that they are, and yeah, a Bordeaux, aka Merlot, would be a uh, would be a classic, wonderful accompaniment. I didn't have a beer idea either. Well, you also get a heartburn when you drink anything but Corona. So I know that's all right. I have a condition. <laughs> if anybody knows how to solve my condition, please let me know because I love all beer. Yeah, it just hurts. It hurts so good. All right. Well, there you have it. We've done it. Uh, Mr. Virgil, Chef Virgil, thank you very yeah, much for pleasure. joining Thanks us. Thanks for letting me be here. I have a feeling, everybody let us know uh, what you think. Obviously, we know you will already. You're, you've are you probably already written your comment five times. Uh, but With if like you haven't yet. the skull and crossbones emoji yeah, and all that stuff. If you haven't yet, write your comment below. What do you? How do you think you do the perfect steak? Yes. Uh, we'd love to hear it. Also, if you're over on Instagram, uh, let us know. Comment there. And uh, if you'd like to see Mr. Chef Virgil come back and enlighten us more about food stuff let us know that or too. start fires either way i'm happy to do both i think Love we're it. gonna get some requests jim i think so too I, one of them will probably be from me but <laughs> let's party let's have you back travis thanks cool all right see everybody on the next one bye that was awesome it's fun travis You're a man fantastic of fantastic information like stuff. there's a reason this all so when we were doing the trainings it's really hard because there's you know, a ton of people and things, and Rube's like, hey, can you come help me with this thing? I'm like, but I'm cooking. (laughs) (laughs) There's a focus here, man. (laughs) This cannot go wrong. People can't have Uh, fun if they don't eat my food. Wow. There's no reason to compromise on execution on that side, so. Yeah. Yeah, I like that you, uh, that you've been playing where you are. There's, there's a logic to all this stuff, which is so cool. I think, uh, for me, it was just like, because I used to, um, I'd say particularly wild game because, again, like old school, th- oh, you got to marinate that so it doesn't taste game, like whatever, uh, you know. How about you take so care I of the do- front end? Like that's my biggest thing as, as coming into it from the food side because I, I, don't, I don't hunt from the like hunting side. I hunt from the food logic side. I want to practice. Right. This is, I'm coming back to it because it's organic and I know where it comes from. Yeah. Right. I know what it's eating. So, yeah. No, you don't need to marinate it. Treat it well from the beginning. It, oh, that's that's mm. so huge. But anyway, I'm, I all of a sudden I like I'm like, just got to this point where I'm like, oh my gosh, less is more. Mm-hmm. 
Just I know. I finally I turned that. When I turned that corner, big change. But you know what I did start? I also turned the corner of going back to charcoal, which I just love. I, I love lump love charcoal. charcoal. Lump charcoal is really cool. Oh, my God. 900 I, degrees all day. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, I, my, my Weber, you know, goes all the way up to, like, 500 degrees, yep. and you put lump in there, and, like, the thing is just pinned. Right? I, uh... So, I, like, can you... Okay, here's my question. Can you, can you cook a steak too hot, or do you just end up cooking it less time? Yes. Ladder. The ladder? Oh, okay. So, who cares then? So, your, I mean, no, your crust cares, is going you know. to caramelize more quickly. It's 338 degrees, or 350 degrees, um, with no moisture will get you caramelization. That's why when we bake at 350, we're looking for caramelization on, on those things. Um, but you're going to rush that process, and the center is not going to catch up if you're right. going from a cold steak. And that's why I don't. Right. Like, I like being, oh, I can put this on a 900-degree grill and be fine with it because all I need to do is develop the crust. Everything else is done. Yeah. When I have time lately, which I often I don't, I just pull it out of the fridge, yep. throw salt and pepper on it, yep. and garlic powder to huck it on the grill. I've been trying to let stuff get to like a room temp. Yep. Is that a little That's bit That's a better? great start. Yeah. Yep. Because you're thinking about it, you're, you're 40 yeah. degrees or you're 65, 70 degrees. You're much closer to where we need to be. Right. Because where we need to be is 125 to 135. Okay. And it goes so past 145 again. It's adjustments, but yes. Um, I mean, so the one thing, the process water. for me that I'm, I really want to get is I really want to get a Blackstone. Have you seen those? Wait. The, yeah. They're, they're, gas, they're a gas griddle. Yeah. Okay. And now, so the, I, I was going to bring this up, but I didn't want to. Inter- inter- interject on your role. I I like that because now it's a, literally a straight up griddle. So we can get crazy crust. We can get crazy um, just like the pan, but now I've got a whole ton of space so I can do a lot more on it too. Like, so it's not like doing like your sides along with it? No, it's like a big... Uh, like a big flat top? Yeah, big flat top. Okay. And that's that. it's 36 inches wide. You know what I, start, what I started doing that I've really liked is I just... I just have designated an outdoor cast iron yep. that I just put on my charcoal grill. Yep. yep. Which then, I actually think makes for really nice food in the end, even yep. better than you'd use on the cast iron inside because yep. you're getting the charcoal smoke billowing up mm-hmm. and going into the cast iron. Smoke is a wonderful flavor. Oh we didn't even gosh. talk about that, but I mean, there's so many things on this whole thing that there's so many elements that come together. You see a lot of the, also in finishing, you see a lot of the chefs that when they're doing it in a cast iron, they've got butter and garlic and a whole bunch of herbs in there and they're basting it constantly. That's that's one of those things that that's really really good. Yeah, it is. It takes a ton of time. Yeah, right. I I'm more on the how do we get this to be awesome, but not spend 27 years doing it because yeah, it's who just has not that always time? practical. Well, yeah. exactly. Who has that time? Not me. The great thing about sous vide for you or a smoker is you don't have time. You come home, you have the steaks already packaged after you cut them. Mm-hmm. We didn't talk about thickness either, but that's another thing. Uh, you have them packaged in like a sous vide bag or a sorry, vacuum seal bag. You stuff them in the sous vide for an hour while you're doing everything else you need to do. You come back, you light, you light your grill, it gets nice and hot. You put the cast iron on there, put a little fat in it, pull them out of that bag, pat them dry, salt them, throw them in the pan, you're done. So you yeah, didn't yeah. do any work for that hour, but you increased the amount of flavor tenfold. Yeah. You know, that's another thing I like doing too is uh, you get the cast iron out there on the grill and you use just the indirect heat method. So like yeah. you stick all of your charcoals on one side yep. and you get your cast iron really hot with like a ton of oil in it. On the charcoal side? Yeah. On the charcoal side. But then when you're ready to cook your steaks, you move it over to the non-charcoal side, dump a ton of cut up potatoes into French fry form, deep fry a bunch of French fries over there on the grill mm-hmm. and then do your steaks directly over the charcoals and like charcoal deep fried cast iron french fries with steak so, is so you're putting thing we need to do is have you buy we need to buy you a tub of duck fat huh? yeah duck fat would be nice i'm going to hopefully jim mm. bring back some bear fat bear mm. fat from what i hear is the glory yes. and if i don't this spring Hopefully I can Dude. kill a super fat bear in the fall, yeah, and we'll get some fat from it. I'll get Fre- some. Fre- I'd some. love some. Some bear fat french Fre- fries. Yeah, Freilich has been talking about that like mad. I've never messed with that, yeah. just so you keep hearing more and more yeah. and more and more about well, it. Well, and so. the thing is, is you heard for so long that bear fat's, bear fat's awful. Right. From the people who, again, aren't in those areas doing that specific animal right. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, bear fat on, on the meat. No, well, you cook it, you render it. Right. 
you take it, you pull all the other stuff out of it, and yeah, now it's a, now it's really good. Okay, well, duck fat's the same way, except none of the ducks around here are fat, or very fatty. So, hmm. but there's a couple of Wisconsin, or, uh, PA farms that'll do like okay. two, two pound tubs of duck fat. I really wanted to do uh, sous vide turkey legs, or not sous vide, uh, confit turkey legs, which are turkey legs that are raw, and then we cure them, so curing salt and all yeah. the good cure stuff, and let them cure for three days, pull them out, rinse them off, pat them down, throw them in a simmering pot of duck fat, let them simmer for like four hours, real low, so they're completely done, and then you actually, because they had all that cure still in them, and now you have that fat all around them, you pull that off the stove, stick it in your fridge, and let it sit for like three months in the in the duck fat because nothing will grow through that much fat. So yeah. It's the same way they do like Parma or uh, prosciutto ham. Yeah. They'll oh, put, so they'll they'll put fat over the cap end and then yeah. you put black peppers over that, right? So I watched must, uh, no. a guy, uh, one of the meat eater guys, uh, made a do prosciutto yeah. out of like a, a deer ham or something like that. Yep. I mean, do that the looks, turkey legs? But then, yeah, you, so the turkey legs are at the bottom of this and they have this much fat over the top of them and you let them cure for, again, three months. Is what they always did in in France. And it's just it was, like natural air temp, for, at least from what yeah. I saw. Like he just hung it up like in the garage. For Parma, you do for but for prosciutto you, or for uh, confit, you generally just throw it in the fridge and let it sit. Okay. Not really a big deal. It doesn't really matter because you could let it sit out all you want. There's no air come getting to that right. whatsoever. That's so crazy. But what's so cool is then when you're ready to eat it, you pull them out, scrape all the fat off, throw them in like a 450 degree oven, mm-hmm. and let them crisp up, and you've got this. Like perfect again, super velvety textured turkey leg. Like I, I want to do it so bad. Oh my god, so bad. That'd be so good. It's um mentally like it's hard to comprehend. Essentially, letting something that seems perishable, like a piece of meat, mm-hmm. just sit for months. Well, the, I know. Other, the other <laughs> yeah. one is like sausage just hanging. Right. What you want me to what? Right. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. weird. Like no, that's fine. All right. Yeah, and just air hanging. We, I mean. That's what's so cool as humans, and if you follow like the old school traditions, which is the things I'm more and more intrigued mm-hmm. by, are people from the 1700s, 1800s. How did we, how did we preserve food in those times? Yeah. When you look at like Africa, those guys make biltong, just yeah. like I think yeah. they put like a probably salt and spices yeah. and air dry. Like it's so um, yeah, like uh, what well, the, the air is just so dry and it's yep. hot that the, it's like just cured. They're trying to pull meat. the moisture before it, it starts to rot. Is yeah, what they're doing. it's pretty yeah. crazy. Have like you seen we the, would uh, have a we'd be hard pressed to do that here in the summertime. Oh yeah, yeah. way yeah, too just, much moisture. Um, have you seen the uh, like the racks that people f- uh, splay an animal out on after it's skin and, oh, that, and then yeah. hang it over the fire ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to do that really bad. That'd be that cool. one looks really mm-hmm. cool. Um, but that's one that I want to do. A lot of these old school classic preparations are so cool to me. Monkey and I were talking once about what what, what one needs to do. You could weld it up out of just like rebar and shit, but basically what you need to do is you get like a, you get like a ring that's just as just thick enough to be able to stick firewood down in it. Okay. Mm-hmm. You get a metal ring that goes all the way around in a circle, and you stick the logs down in your metal ring so they stand up straight. You have a, a stand in the center that comes into like a center like post that yeah. sticks straight up, right? Light your ring on fire, and then you basically just like stick a piece of meat down in the center and you just let it spin around and you basically make like uh whatever the greek you know yeah uh, what's the thing like gyro meat uh shawarma yeah Yeah. Um, basically do like uh like a shawarma type the best part is with the ring you wouldn't have to it could just sit it wouldn't have to rotate yeah because it's like already it's already 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 right well yeah i mean so it wouldn't even have to rotate you just stick it down in yeah but it would just get like hot It'd be really interesting. The other thing that'd be kind of cool is because because you have a ring all, all around the outside of it, you could probably find a way to put whatever liquid, if you wanted to, to kind of steam or catch all that, you could put it underneath inside that ring mm-hmm. and like have the post come through it so it's just a basin. Mm-hmm. And you could put all sorts of flavorful stuff in there too and then uh, pull that out and then add that to the, the process later. Yeah. But that'd be super good. Yeah. It's like a rotisserie without having to Rot- rotisserize. It yeah. is, yeah. Yeah. There you go, Jim. That's cool. Patent, patent. We'll call pending. it a. We'll call it a. We'll call it to bring a fire. We'll call it a still tisserie. Does it just stay still? <laughs> <laughs>